Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Uh, good morning to everyone. Welcome to CSIS virtually. Uh, today's event on cybersecurity for critical infrastructure American and European perspectives, I think will be an interesting one. We have a good lineup. My name is Jim Lewis. Uh, I work at CSIS and have worked on cybersecurity for a while. <coughs> Pardon me. Today's agenda is we'll have opening remarks by Isabella Albrecht of the Kosciuszko Institute. She's the chair of the Institute and the chair of the CyberSec Program Committee. Um, we'll then be followed with a panel that has John Costello, <clears throat> Chief of Staff for the National Cyber Director, uh, Robert Kosla, Director of the Cybersecurity Department in the Prime Minister's Office in Poland, and Sebastian Bergermeister, a managing partner at BW Advisory. So it'll be a good discussion. We'll start with Isabella making opening remarks for 10 minutes or so. Isabella, over to you. Thank you very much, Jim. Uh, good morning to American friends and participants, and good afternoon to participants from uh, European side uh, of the Atlantic. Um, it is great to be back uh, to the US, uh, even if it is only uh, virtually. Uh, Jim, as you may be remember, when the CyberSec uh, team visited CSIS uh, headquarters in Washington last time, so in March 2019, before the COVID-19 breakout, we had some big uh, plans for putting together a joint on-site event. Uh, and I truly hope that uh, soon we'll come back uh, to those plans and meet each other um, again in the physical realm. Meanwhile, I'm really happy to support this important online exchange. Uh, I just finished the intervention during the um, security, uh, the, the Singapore International Cybersecurity Week. Uh, so um, uh, the, the same discussion uh, basically took place. Uh, and the first question was uh, what keeps Madame Minister uh, Josephine Tio uh, of uh, communication and information wake up at, uh, awake at night? And she basically said that protection of critical infrastructure. So we have very good topic to discuss today. Uh, and I think that the cooperation on a cybersecurity risk management and particularly on security and resilience of critical infrastructure uh, on which our security and prosperity uh, rely is now vital. Cyber threats uh, to critical infrastructure are growing becoming more sophisticated and the critical infrastructure proved to be particularly uh, vulnerable. This increasing threat is mainly driven on the one side by geopolitics shift and growing aggressive posture in cyberspace of multiple actors, um, nation state actors, but also cyber criminals uh, or another way around. And on the other side, by advancements in the process of digitization, the digitization of everything, and soon to be accelerated even more by progressing development and implementation of more and more solutions based on emerging and disruptive technologies. The interplay uh, and the interference of these technologies has been widening the cyber threat landscape and cybersecurity gap. And this process will only accelerate as we move forward into the digital decade full of new uh, dependencies between physical and cyber. Uh, through the whole pandemic, the CyberSec Forum has been advocating the need for enhanced cyber and digital cooperation between transatlantic partners and collaboration between so-called like-minded countries. Uh, I'm glad that as we speak, we can see new development supporting such approach. Last week, the first meeting of EU and US Trade and Technology Council, um, which although it has not specifically mentioned cybersecurity cooperation, uh, its fields of interest are definitely 
impacting cybersecurity realm too, and we should consider that as a very good development. But at the same time, we can hear also from the White House that the process of building the cooperation, which will bring together 30 countries to accelerate cooperation in combating cybercrime, improving law enforcement, uh, collaboration stemming the illicit use of cryptocurrency and engaging on these issues diplomatically is now advancing. The US is also building a coalition of nations to advocate for and invest in trusted 5G technology and to better secure supply chains. And it is all very relevant to the discussion we are having today. Uh, and there will be, um, and I hope that there will be many EU countries in this club uh, uh, for, for, for the cooperation on, uh, on uh, cyber uh, crime uh, and uh, law enforcement collaboration. Um, despite this important and good developments, um, the crafted and closer cooperation on cybersecurity of critical infrastructure, particularly between the EU and the US is very much needed now. And I will concentrate on four possible dimensions of such collaboration. First is EU-US level, then CE and US level, and private sector collaboration level, and last but not least, NATO level. So starting with the EU, uh, even that the EU and the US have already focused their attention on the same cyber threats with special recognition of threats for critical infrastructure, and they also have history of cybersecurity cooperation, in the view of many decision makers and experts, this collaboration is not yet enough effective and practical. We need, as soon as possible, to, to develop systemic cooperation between EU and EU countries with the US government on that particular topic. Maybe as an example, uh, can serve the latest development with been quad a gathering um, uh, comprises of US, India, uh, Japan and Australia. Uh, these four countries declared building on long-standing collaboration on cybersecurity and launching new efforts to bolster critical infrastructure resilience against cyber threats by, by bringing together the expertise of their nations to drive domestic and international best practices. That's the quote. Another good example of such an enhanced collaboration came a month ago with US-Singapore again a declaration on strategic partnership for new challenges, including cybersecurity cooperation for a new era with three agreements that will expand cybersecurity cooperation uh, with respect to the financial sector, military to military engagement, and regional capacity building. And there is a lot of expertise to be shared with EU in that respect. And it is a lot of expertise to be shared with Central Eastern Europe region. And the message from uh, the Central Eastern uh, Europe region, which I represent, is that since it is particularly exposed to hybrid threats, including cyber attacks and sabotage of critical infrastructure, we should continue to strengthen the collaboration and best practices exchange within the crisis initiative. It can be done together with the US uh, as the strategic partner of this geopolitically important region. And the aim should be to build resilience and security of the infrastructure in the region, the one which is now being deployed or planning to de be deployed in the future. Since the free seas initiative is aimed at the development of energy, transport, and digital infrastructure, then there is an urgent need to enhance such collaboration and the invest the three Cs funds in cybersecurity. Uh, in the latest Kościuszko Institute report, we presented a couple of recommendations on what is needed in that respect in the CE region. And many of them are related to critical infrastructure protection. So I encourage you to find it on our website. Uh, then on the private sector role uh, in terms of uh, 
collaboration to protect and secure critical infrastructure. And here, let me concentrate a bit more on Poland, because Poland has become a place where we innovate and create solutions to secure networks and systems against adversarial actions. Last year, the Kościuszko Institute established Cyber Made in Poland cluster. The cluster enjoys the support from the Polish Ministry of Foreign Affairs and Polish Ministry of Digital Affairs. Uh, it is uh, gathering today more than 40 cybersecurity companies, including companies working on cutting edge solutions for security of industrial control systems or open run, including 5G open run. And since involvement of the private sector is crucial for cybersecurity and for the creation of cybersecurity risk management frameworks for critical infrastructure, they, then I, I can see a great potential for the mutually beneficial collaboration between American and Polish as well as European companies in the field of critical infrastructure protection. And last but not least, uh, another Another platform of cooperation on critical infrastructure between European countries and the transatlantic partners is now NATO. Uh, strengthening this particular, particular field of allies collaboration, including increasing resilience of infrastructure within the concept of civil preparedness is of huge importance for our shared security. Um, due to the military using civilian infrastructure, including resources and assets from railways to harbors, airports and networks in efficient uh, transport of troops and equipment, civil preparedness has come to be seen as a significant element in allied resilience and a vital factor in NATO's joint defense, as well as its capacity building. And within NATO, we should also well manage both the risk, uh, risk and, and opportunities of emerging technologies like quantum computing and artificial intelligence for critical infrastructure protection. And this can be done within Diana, so Defense Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic and Innovation Fund frameworks of collaboration, which have been now developed. Uh, in NATO's Brussels summit communique, we can uh, read that um, uh, NATO and allies within their respective authorities will maintain and enhance the security of critical infrastructure, key industries, supply chains, and communication information networks, including 5G. So to sum up, we should aim at building strategic partnership between the US and the EU to share expertise, resources, and competences for mutual benefits. Um, and maybe I can also uh, at the end uh, paraphrase what President Joe Biden said on October 1st. He said that the whole of nation efforts to confront uh, cyber threats is needed, adding at the first place that he is committed to strengthening um, cybersecurity by hardening the US critical infrastructure against cyber attacks. Uh, so I will uh, paraphrase uh, that in a way that uh, this is the whole of like-minded countries and allies effort. Um, we need to work together to increase the protection of our critical assets, which is the infrastructure at the first place. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to the discussion and then practical steps to enhance this cooperation between European uh, countries and US governments and US companies. Thank you so much. Thank you, Isabella. That was great and uh, perfect timing too. We're now going to go to our panel of experts, uh, Sebastian Bergmeister, John Costello, and Robert Kosla. Uh, what I'll do is I'm going to ask them questions. They can respond uh, briefly, I hope, and we'll have a conversation about cybersecurity and critical, in critical infrastructure. Let me start with one that might help the audience a little bit, but maybe each of you could give your views on um, when we say resilience, what is it we mean? What is resilience for critical infrastructure? John, do you want to start? Certainly. Uh, I 
First of all, Jim, uh, thanks for uh, having me. Um, this is my first uh, speaking engagement in my new position as uh, Chief of Staff for the Office of the National Cyber Director, uh, a, a newly established position in the U.S. government. Um, and certainly happy to talk about uh, U.S.-EU comparative approaches and cooperation when it comes to critical infrastructure protection. Resilience to me uh, is... Um, is composed of a number of different components. I'd say at a baseline level is the is the, the basic security of an ecosystem to begin with, um, whether that's the technical uh, components of that ecosystem or whether it's the functional components of that ecosystem, one meaning the technologies on which they rely and, and under, underpin them. And, and the second is how different services and different functions interact. Say if power were to go down and, um, you know, cause cascading failures in banking system or in, in communications. I'd say more broadly, resilience is the ability of any of these systems to quickly respond and rebound um, and, and continue functionality in, in some method and, and by some means, uh, regardless of a disruption or regardless of destruction. A perfectly resilient system would be one that resists uh, disruption or destruction from a security perspective, but ultimately one that can very quickly continue functionality in some form in the event of destruction or disruption. Great, thank you. Uh, Robert, let me ask you the same question. Um, when you think about it from your position in the Chancery, what is resilience? Uh, Thank you very much for this question. Actually, I can address the resilience uh, through uh, cybersecurity aspects. Of course, resilience is one of the strategic goals uh, covered in our national cybersecurity strategy for that was adopted by the Council of Ministers in 2019. And this, this strategy should be implemented until 2024. So resiliency is one of two, two goals, strategic goals. First of all, is the uh, resiliency against, and this is related to cybersecurity, against cyber attacks. But of course, we are talking about um, uh, how to avoid disruptions of critical information infrastructure. This is, this is my focus on, uh, and um, uh, my major concern about, uh, about the infrastructure itself. And the second is, of course, the increased um, uh, increase capabilities in information protection. So talking about, about uh, resilience, this is the, the way how the country should um, focus on, um, on the maintenance and also continuous, uh, um, continuous availability of uh, critical services. So that's why uh, where we refer directly at the national level, of course, implementing the network and the, the NIST directive in, 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 in European countries, we are focusing on how to protect uh, essential services. So essential services, of course, you may ask how they refer to critical services and how they refer to critical infrastructure. What, what I see actually that resilience become more, more, uh, more and more important right now, also in, uh, in this uh, relationship and connection between critical infrastructure and critical uh, digital services. So resiliency is about both. It's about how to maintain, how to keep, um, how to protect infrastructure and how to protect services running on that infrastructure. Great, thank you. Sebastian, you work with a lot of companies. Uh, what's your perspective on this? Uh, thank you, Jim, for, for the question. And uh, uh, I prefer to use uh, different, different words uh, than resilience. Uh, I, I think from my perspective, it's uh, better to use the anti-fragile uh, than, than only resilience because uh, the anti-fragile also um, uh, use uh, the way uh, after the incident uh, the companies uh, could adapt to the new uh, to the new situation uh, and uh, uh, easily quite easily uh, uh, use the capabilities to to respond to to every uh, every major uh, incident of course uh, in uh, in today's interconnected world there is no such things like linear uh, linear thinking and uh, uh, linear um, uh, incidents. Uh, that's why uh, what I see uh, uh, in, uh, uh, when I'm working with my clients, uh, I see uh, interconnection between uh, a lot of suppliers, vendors, partners, and uh, the uh, resilience or anti-fragile uh, also based on the uh, 
complete security of uh, of the ecosystem that uh, is connected to this uh, one client or uh, to the uh, to the uh, to the country or to the system itself that's why i'm uh, looking at it uh, so that from the uh, protection and also adaptation to the new situation and uh, to the new uh, risk or threats great thank you um those are all good answers but it raises a question and we have a this this program will be rebroadcast to a broader audience so let me um let me ask you what is critical infrastructure in the digital age it's is it expanded beyond our old understanding of uh uh, you know, electricity and banks and a few other things. What is critical infrastructure now? How do we define it? John, do you want to start again? So I can give you the, the sort of the textbook answer as it's uh, the systems, assets and functions uh, on which uh, national security, economic security and public and health and safety uh, rely, um, which is the, the, the straight up policy and textbook definition. Um, you know, I, I think Robert sort of hit on it in his opening remarks. I think critical infrastructure is really uh, the critical services that that really underpin the functioning of society and in separate, but certainly interrelated, the functioning of the critical functions of the state as well. And that's where we get into national security systems, things that underpin the military. I think to your point, the, the idea of what critical infrastructure is has expanded over time, given largely due to the fact that it is so interrelated and interconnected connected on technology. I mean, when if we, the original sort of definition of critical infrastructure and this concept sort of originated in the in the late 90s, we were talking about strict critical services and uh, telecommunications um, and uh, cyber related services were a part of that. But as you know, as this has become a sort of technical strata that underpins everything, uh, it's become something uh, separate, something that requires its own attention, something that is, I think, substantively and in a, in a degree, uh, something that needs to be looked at on its own. Um, the European Union, I think, does an interesting job in how they categorize uh, critical infrastructure rather than sort of having 16 sectors that are sort of categories of critical infrastructure. Um, uh, and I, I think we're getting to a place where looking at the physical related critical infrastructure, things like energy, water, et cetera, uh, lifeline sectors, if you will, um, require special attention, I think separate and distinct from um, a cyber critical infrastructure or information infrastructure. The countries, I think, have a number of ways of how they describe it that are uh, the telecommunications infrastructure and then the, the suite of technologies, manufacturing, development, and services that themselves constitute the cyber ecosystem. But overall, I think we're, we're finding that as, as society has grown more dependent on technology, it has increased the vulnerability by which society can be disrupted. So as critical, inf as, as services have gotten more and more into our daily lives and we become more dependent on them, it goes to say, it goes, you know, it goes without saying that they've become more critical and thus the sort of footprint or the area has expanded for sure. Great, Robert, uh, do you wanna pick this one up, please? I think that we, if we will follow the, the definitions that's been uh, quite recently discussed among EU member states uh, under a discussion within the proposal uh, for uh, the directive of the European Parliament and the Council on Resilience uh, of Critical Entities, I think it's quite obvious right now that we are shifting, shifting our focus uh, from the classic infrastructure that what John has also mentioned uh, into essential services. So essential services, uh, those are of course the, the services uh, important or um, uh, essential for the maintenance of uh, vital, um, uh, vital services for society and uh, economic activities. And then referring to infrastructure itself, this is actu actually the, the asset system or the part of, the, uh, the, of it, which is really necessary to run those essential services. So this is the definition. This is the way how we approach it. And I like this approach because fr from the from the legacy uh, legacy um, approach, when we when we looked on the infrastructure and we lost in our mind and, and our focus services, uh, I think this is the, the good the good direction. Great, thank you, uh, Sebastian. Thank you, and. Uh, uh, 
I think uh, 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 Robert uh, have a lot of uh, interesting points, especially that uh, uh, right now, uh, the development of the definition of in, uh, uh, critical infrastructure goes into the critical systems because uh, the infrastructure could be uh, could be on premise or in the cloud and we, so, right now we could not sometimes define what is critical infrastructure if uh, the hospital have uh, his all infrastructure in the cloud what is the critical infrastructure so the uh, uh, cloud service provider will be critical inf uh, infrastructure right now. He will be part of the uh, uh, ser critical service, but uh, uh, his uh, uh, infrastructure, of course, for this service will be critical, but for other services could be not critical. So that's why I like the idea uh, going from the infrastructure to the service because uh, the service is based on the infrastructure and we have to protect the services and then because of that we'll protect the infrastructure great thank you well, sebastian let me pick up on something you said earlier which is you use the word uh, fragile and i kind of like that word although it's a bit disconcerting having done this for a while i'd say that some sectors are in much better shape than they were a decade ago john i don't know if you agree but we still have some crucial vulnerabilities so could each of you give us sort of a status report? Where are, we, where are we on critical infrastructure? Where is it fragile? Where's the risks? And I know that's a complicated question, but you know, for a general audience, what's your 50,000 foot view of uh, where we are, um, how we're doing? So John, do you wanna start with that one? Certainly, uh, thanks, Jim. So I think in certain sectors, I think we're doing quite well. Uh, the finance and uh, the finance sector, I think, is doing uh, really well. Um, the energy sector is getting there, um, and they're but overall they're doing well. They're 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 pouring a lot of attention into it. The the oil and natural gas uh, uh, sector and the transport sector writ large, I think, has had a little bit of a wake up call this year, and they are starting to make progress. Um, but they, their CEOs and their corporate leadership are very much paying attention and, and regulators are certainly paying attention as well. I think um, if we're looking at the sector model just in general, I think water is one that uh, I think is going to require a lot of attention and one that is particularly um, a pernicious one uh, just simply by how it is governed. There is no FERC for water. I'm not saying there should be, um, but I, there is no FERC for water. This is largely operated by state and municipal municipalities. Now, as far as like a, an adversary's ability to disrupt large scale across the country, that is a that is a net positive because that, that system is inherently federated and resilient. We have something similar with election security, um, which isn't a security of the infrastructure itself, but rather the, the content that, that I think that guides uh, voter confidence and behavior. The election uh, uh, infrastructure, I think, is doing better uh, since 2016 for 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 a certainty. Um, that has been, you know, gotten a lot of attention from Congress and from the the administration. I'd say, as a general matter. Um, one of the biggest vulnerabilities we have is simply the the, the technology and the services that we we use. Um, I, I think there's been a lot of attention and a lot of work towards uh, creating more secure um, services and more secure products over time, and, and to create some type of transparency for consumers uh, so that they can spend their money where security will go the furthest. But we can't get around the fact that the security burden is still being passed to um, critical infrastructure uh, owners and operators that do not have the capital, uh, the know-how, or the um, uh, the capacity to take on and properly manage that security burden. I think that's some of the biggest tensions I think the US and the EU have to deal with from a governance perspective. Um, and there's no getting around that, that the, the, the systems that we use are still uh, vulnerable. Now that may be an extension of just um, and just endemic to the technology space itself. I don't think anyone would argue with that, but we, it's something we do need to manage. Last point, and I don't want to take up too much time for my for my wonderful colleagues here, is um, just understanding risk itself has gotten far harder over the last few decades. 
as things have gotten more interconnected, as technology has become more suffused with everything, it's getting harder and harder to understand how functions and services interact and how they could potentially cause cascading failures or how could they be passing risk on to others. Um, and uh, unfortunately, I think for governments everywhere is adversaries are figuring out how that works before the defenders are for a variety of reasons that I'm, I'm sure we can get into, um, which is why I think a lot of times in dealing with cybersecurity and, and resilience and critical infrastructure protection in general, it tends to be it tends to look reactionary. Um, we could diagnose that, we can interrogate that a little bit, but it's often because we don't realize that there is a particular pathway of, of scaled threat or scaled risk until it materializes in some real way. Um, I'd say that in and of itself, beyond sort of which sector is vulnerable or not, is a is an enduring vulnerability. I know the good folks at CISA um, and across the government are looking to, to try to get better answers on. So I yield my time. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Robert, I saw you nodding your head at various points. Uh, what's your view on this question? Yeah, because I agree with John. And of course, we, the, the point where we start, um, it's, it's identify interdependencies between different sectors and they have potential impact on other, on, on other sectors. So of course, based on uh, this directive implementation, we identify seven, seven major sectors. But uh, of course, uh, after many years of implementation of this directive into Polish legal system and also our observations across European countries, it is quite, it is quite clear that it's not, it's, not, uh, it's not a full list right now. What's more, we missed, one, we missed a few sectors like telecommunication sector. So uh, the way how uh, European Union designed the system that is actually the, the full of silo uh, covering different sectors without without even common operational picture and common situation awareness what's going on in the specific sector and how the sector um, impact, uh, what is the impact of the sector on the other sectors. That's what we try to, right now to fill the gap, to, to close this, this um, and really have the interdependencies fully identified for the national cybersecurity system, because this is our goal. It's not a goal to, to implement the system for reporting the incidents, but actually to identify which, what is dependency? And this is the way how we implemented this on the national level. So just one, one practice from our, from our, uh, from our Polish um, implementation, it's actually development of the nation, nationwide system. It's called national, uh, it was called on national cybersecurity platform. Right now it's a system S46. And this system actually collects information from all sector of national cybersecurity system. So it's quite unique because we, that improves um, that improves um, uh, situation awareness. And what's more, we incorporated dynamic and static uh, risk, um, uh, risk assessment tools. And so in, we can dynamically see that the attack against the banking sector or energy sector, what is the potential impact on other sectors? And of course, what are the, the most critical resources? So I think this fra fragility from one side, it's actually the, the way um, that the, we should map it with the, with the impact and we should map it with the new approach, by the way, also proposed by Poland to define additional, additional, additional category of entities. So until now at the European level, we talked about essential entities. So operators of essential services being essential entities. Uh, we extended this list and we talk right now about important entities. So of course, uh, to fill the gap and to identify other other uh, sectors and subsectors, for instance, uh, media or uh, social media, and what's the impact, of course, on the on on the other sectors. So this is something that I believe um, uh, this is the ongoing process. We should share the, our experiences from from Europe and, and from US uh, to 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 divide to develop and design the most effective system. Great. Yeah, I, social media was on my list. I was going to ask you all. You don't have to answer. Does it count as a critical infrastructure? I think some people would say yes. Uh, more importantly was the point you both brought up before I turned to Sebastian of interdependency. And I don't think we realize fully, one of the problems with the old approach was to your point, Robert, silos. Uh, I have advised some big companies and you need electricity, you need water, you need other things for them to deliver. The, it was a telecom company for them to deliver their service. So interdependency, uh, among critical infrastructures. It's probably a point worth exploring. But Sebastian, let me get your take on this. Uh, thank you. Uh, and what is my experience uh, cooperating with uh, 
critical infrastructure companies or uh, critical services companies, what I see, uh, first of all, uh, the difference of maturity. Uh, so the financial system, uh, energy, uh, ener energy, uh, energy sector and financial sector is uh, uh, much more mature than, uh, for example, transport sector or health sector. Um, in Poland, uh, in Poland, uh, for example, and but uh, the uh, adversaries, I don't think they will uh, uh, attack uh, uh, one hospital. They will focus on the most critical system. So they will focus on the energy sector uh, or the financial sector or any other sector or companies uh, uh, which is major. Uh, 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 which has major impact uh, uh, on the state level. So uh, I understand why uh, why the uh, maturity is different. Uh, different. What I also see in almost in every sector that uh, uh, the companies uh, do not really manage uh, the, uh, the third four party risk. So the supply chain attack. Uh, will be quite uh, easy to uh, to do uh, from the adversary point of view. Uh, even uh, even sometimes uh, uh, they are do not uh, understand that uh, uh, there is only two or three suppliers uh, in one sector for the critical uh, software like uh, ICS software or the software for uh, for uh, uh, managing the hospital and so on. And uh, I think it's also very important from the systemic point of view to understand that uh, the attack on not uh, this particular hospital, but for this ser uh, service provider will uh, have much more impact than uh, attacking uh, one or two companies. This is the example of the solar wind uh, attack or other uh, vendor attack. Uh, the attacker will focus uh, on the companies uh, for, uh, uh, that will uh, have much more impact on other companies on, uh, on the federal, on the state level. Great, thank you. Uh, since you all brought it up in some way, um, one of the debates here is the balance between mandatory requirements for security and critical infrastructure and remaining in a voluntary approach. And, you know, the example that helped start this was the colonial pipelines, uh, the gas, uh, oil, the fuel company um, was under voluntary standards developed by uh, the government. And some people came away from that saying are voluntary standards enough maybe we can reframe the question a little bit by asking how do we best incentivize the private sector and i'll just put a caveat in here i've been doing this for for about 10 years and so if you if you say well if you say some of the words like information sharing or something then we'll press a buzzer but uh let's talk about how you incentivize the private sector Isabella, I know you're still uh, online, even if you're off camera. So if you ever want to jump in, please do so. But John, um, what are the best incentives? And regulation is an incentive, but not necessarily the best. John. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a that's a really good question, Jim. I think that is the question uh, I think governments have to wrestle with, in, in my opinion. I don't think we can, uh, you know, critical infrastructure is not a monolith. Um, I think a number of critical infrastructure sectors are already regulated, sometimes heavily, sometimes overlapping. Uh, the financial sector, uh, at least, um, is, you know, has numerous uh, regulatory overseers and uh, has a number of uh, regulations. My sense is, is this, is that um, for a number of sectors, we've reached, I think, the limit of what voluntary uh voluntary standards and voluntary uh, public-private collaboration can accomplish. Um, and I think uh, we, you know, the U.S. needs to explore what mandatory requirements look like in certain circumstances. I know the, the Congress is currently considering a number of measures, at least um, when it comes to incident reporting, which in my mind is a bare bones uh, requirement. Um, 
it goes to, I mean, it goes without saying that if you're informing the government of a particular incident or a particular threat that you notice, what's going to follow on after that is the questions about what you're doing about it, how you're going to prevent an incident like that in, in, in the future. There's also benefits, uh, obviously, um, from being able to share that information across a number of critical infrastructure sectors and entities that are almost certainly uh, similarly targeted. We get down to brass tacks about critical infrastructure uh, protection standards themselves, something like FERC has put on the electric uh, industry. I think, um, I think those have been effective in some degree. Um, I, I know that, uh, you know, I, we, I don't think anyone has cracked the code perfectly on how did we get beyond a checklist approach. I certainly don't have, I think, fully mature and uh, uh, thoughts on the matter. But I know it's something that uh, the U.S. government is looking at. I know it's something Congress is, is continuously considering on really how do we strike that balance? And more importantly, how do we strike that balance uh, with respect to the relative maturity of each sector in this space? Um, and I'm gonna, not going to pick on water, but of a very mature sector like water versus an incredibly mature sector like the financial sector, which has the benefits of you know sufficient capital to invest in cybersecurity, as well as uh, you know the ex, you know the risk being externalized and evident through financial loss uh, through like fraud. Um, so how do we? Um, how do we realign those incentives across sector? I know that's not a particularly satisfact, uh, satisfying answer, but I agree with you. Um, I agree with you. It's something that the U.S. government needs to take a look at. It is, um, but overall, I think we've hit the limits across a number of sectors with what a purely voluntary approach can achieve. Great, thank you, um, Robert. What's the situation in Poland when it comes to voluntary or mandatory? Uh, so we went through, of course, uh, first through voluntary uh, approach uh, for many years, and we know very well that it doesn't work effectively. So um, we observed, of course, the, the situation and development of the situation around Colonial pipe, Pipeline in the U.S. So we had an immediate call with our colleagues from DHS, CISA, and we shared our best practices how we approach this type of situation. And uh, talking about uh, from voluntary to, uh, to mandatory, this is of course, the, the type of balance. So first we start with voluntary. If it doesn't work, then the, then the regulation is needed. Then of course the penalties are needed. That's what you can find also starting from uh, data protection through NIS and through other regulations. So of course, but of course to, to, to move to mandatory uh, approach, you need to provide the right guidance. You need to provide support. You, you cannot just only the pen penalize and you can not only request or then uh, follow the, the compliancy if there is not, so, not enough support. So talking about voluntary, uh, first we, we adopted a similar, uh, similar approach like US. So uh, development, common development by, by government and industry, um, standards, recommendations, technical, technical special, special documents, special publications like this. So we, we also started to develop the, the set of national cybersecurity standards. We, we publish uh, the, the set of uh, many documents right now covering first of them uh, covered uh, cybersecurity requirements for cloud computing. But you ask about how to incentivize public sector. I think the major incentive for public sector is to really start to collaborate and, and act with public sector, uh, public, with public, private sector. Because uh, what we observed in the past, it was usually it was declaration, declarations about uh, partnerships. And there was nothing behind. I, can, I know what I'm talking about because uh, first I worked for the Polish government for 15 years, then 10 years for one of the global uh, companies. And I came back to, 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 the, to, to work again with the government. So I, I know both sides. So actually what I, what, what I was missing in the, working for the, for the business and commercial side was only declarations from the government. And there was no real uh, will to work with the private sector. In many cases, there've been a lot of answers for questions asked by government already developed in the in the industry but those uh, answers be not used by the government because you know sometimes of course the corruption um, um, uh, object objectives and, and and so on so i think what is quite important is to to, to mix uh, and to to really um, benefit uh, from what industry developed and i can tell you in 2019 in poland we introduced the program it's it's called cybersecurity cooperation program it's about five major areas where we started to cooperate with industry. So we have 14 companies right now engaged and another 14 already in the pipeline. And it's about 
uh, increase cybersecurity awareness. So building the education programs together with industry, based on materials already developed by industry uh, for specific services and specific products. Second, it's about ident identification of the vulnerabilities and threats and sharing those threats by industry. Industry developed this information. So of course, the question is how government is using this. The third was about security baselines. So configurations, baselines, how to, how to use them across public sector, both baseline developed uh, and usually based on, on the practice from the uh, private sector. The fourth was about evaluation and certification. And that's how we work with industry uh, to help and to prepare specific services and products for a formal evaluation on cybersecurity. And the fifth one, and I think very important, where incentives from the, for the um, uh, private sector are more than welcome, it's about how to promote innovative solutions to increase resiliency, to, to implement more secure environments. So running this program in Poland, we have very good practices developed, best practices developed. And you can ask Polish, Polish the companies present in, in uh, working in Poland and present in this program, how they, what the value they see uh, coming from this real partnership, not the declarative one. Thank you. Great, thank you. Let me note before we turn to Sebastian that we're getting a few questions. Uh, in the chat, and most of them focus on uh, cooperation, transatlantic cooperation, the role of NATO, and how things are working, how to strengthen US-EU collaboration. So after we hear from Sebastian about voluntary versus mandatory, uh, we'll turn to those aspects. So, but Sebastian, if you want to close us out on uh, how to incentivize the private sector. First of all, uh, the private sector incentivize themselves if, uh, uh, it's uh, the cybersecurity. It's uh, uh, connected to the uh, to the business. It's easy. This is easy. If uh, it's really connected to uh, to the business, uh, uh, the private sector will invest uh, money uh, to be uh, cyber secure. If not, we have to uh, create, uh, let's say, some mandatory requirements. But after that, uh, they have to be some penalties and uh, the penalties similar to the GDPR uh, idea. So uh, it has to be uh, very high penalties for not be comply uh, with those requirements. But of course, on the other, uh, on the, on the other side, IT and OT comply. So the, the idea of compliance with the requirements, uh, it's not, uh, uh, the same as the security and our cyber security of the company. So uh, after the requirements and IT compliance or OT or ICS uh, compliance, they have to be some external verification. So the external audits uh, from the, uh, let's say, government or the third parties to verify if those requirements are met not only on the paper, but in the real uh, in the real situation. So I saw a lot of companies that have a, a lot of uh, papers, procedures, procedures, but at the technical level, they are not uh, they're completely not secure. So of course, uh, first of all, we are trying to uh, mm, create some uh, baseline, uh, some baseline mandatory requirements. Afterward, penalties, but we have to check if it's uh, false, uh, false positive or false negative. Great, thank you. And one of my new tests for any recommendation that people make is how would we actually implement it? How would we operationalize it? And if you can't answer, it's easy to come up with recommendations, I think, as Robert was saying, that are like, cybersecurity is good and we should all advance it. Great idea. Tell me what you actually want to do. Let me, since you brought up GDPR, let me turn to the, some of the collaborative and international aspects of this. And so one of the things that came up in Isabella's remarks was how do we strengthen uh, US-EU collaboration on cybersecurity? Um, important to get the like-minded nations more or less in the same place when it comes to resilience. Uh, John, uh, do you wanna start again? Yeah, so I think uh, engagement, I think engagement is the number one thing that we're doing. And I, I think the, the Biden administration certainly uh, is doing that and is trying to advance that. As regard to the role of NATO, uh, 
One thing I think we need to make sure of is that the U.S. and its involvement in NATO, that all the all allied countries have a common sort of uh, framework for sharing threat information. Um, there's much that we can learn from the Europeans, specifically on the disinformation space. The Euro uh, Europeans have been dealing with Russian disinformation for decades and are well steeped in it. And we know that that can have uh, effects on resilience um, and on uh, public confidence. I think that's, that's certainly uh, a major issue. I think CERT to CERT cooperation, I think is essential, both with the US and EU CERT and individual uh, member country CERTs. Um, I think we have to continue uh, to make sure that we're strong in that, in that perspective. Um, with uh, legal attaches uh, from the um, uh, cyber crime element, I think we, we need to continue to strengthen and I need to push forward on that. I think what we've seen over the last few years is um, as we continue to be vulnerable in this space and as threat actors everywhere continue to get more sophisticated, we're seeing uh, um, the asymmetry of cyber capabilities really rise in the uh, disruptive power of cyber criminals. Uh, Colonial Pipeline is an ex a excellent example of that. Um, and I think it's a common concern for both the, uh, the European Union and the United States. I think that's going to be a key area of consideration. Before we move on, I wanted to sort of circle back around to the voluntary piece. Didn't mean to sort of, uh, I think, overstate uh, the mandatory aspect. I think voluntary uh, information sharing and voluntary public-private cooperation is the foundation that needs to be maintained, much like Robert said, uh, that needs to be sort of the prerequisite, it needs a place where we start from. But overall accountability is what we need to be trying to reach. And maybe that's accountability in a negative sense, um, making sure uh, companies are doing the right thing, but it also means accountability in the positive sense that the US government and governments everywhere are in some way rewarding the type of behavior that we would like to see in the, the sectors and the entities that are doing it appropriately. So sorry to circle back, but I wanted to double tap that. Okay, great. No, um, Robert, let me ask you about this question of uh, US-European collaboration and what would you do? I, I think we, we already have this cooperation. Of course, um, there are some, some economic interests, both from EU side and the US side. And, and you know, the most uh, controversial discussions are around uh, cloud computing and cloud uh, service providers. That's where we have a discussion around uh, certification for the cloud service providers and our point and our, our, um, our argument is, of course, we should, we should not forget about uh, transatlantic uh, strategic relationship with US. And so, she, so, so at least the Polish, Polish position is uh, we should uh, uh, not to develop two categories of, of, of uh, providers like trusted from EU and non-trusted outside of EU. Because in this case, of course, we are losing transatlantic strategic um, uh, security um, um, measures, but at least Talking about EU, uh, I would refer to what was the, what was um, uh, achieved by e EU US Trade and Technology Council, and uh, during the first meeting in Pittsburgh, and declaration that was signed on the 29th of September, so just a quite quite fresh document, establishment of 10 working groups, and of course these 10 working groups will will cover. Uh, such areas like like uh, secure supply chains. This is very important, of course, for us. The, of course, investment screening and, of course, information and uh, communication technology and services security and competitiveness. So those are, the, those are some, uh, some regulations and some, uh, I believe, in outcomes from these working groups can create the good foundation for, for um, closer cooperation. But talking about cooperation itself, we, uh, I think it's a case-by-case -case, uh, basis as well. So let's, um, uh, we, we just talk about Colonial Pipeline, but th there have been many other situations when, when the Polish, Polish team uh, worked with DHS CISA, for instance, on delivering some information how to mitigate the vulnerability on, on the print, um, uh, print uh, driver software vulnerability in Microsoft. We shared this, uh, the, the, the first analysis and first proposal how to solve this problem, even when the, the solution from Microsoft was not published yet. Uh, another story was, of course, ransomware attacks against, against uh, infrastructure in US. We shared this on, the, on, the, on the, I may say, daily basis. We, just two weeks ago, we had another round of, of discussions with our DHS CISA colleagues. And we are working right now on some dedicated workshop because in case of ransomware, it's not so important actually to analyze the artifacts um, 
and capture the evidences of attack, but in the most, the most uh, important action after the ransomware attack is to recover the critical service. So that's why we, we share our best practice, how Poland, how Polish ransomware expert team recovers operations after the attacks against hospital infrastructure, regional and, gov regional and, and uh, local and regional governments. What's more, this type of collaboration we established um, uh, before uh, for helping our colleagues from Ireland to recover after, after ransomware attacks against their healthcare system. So I think just creating the, the, the common, common understanding, creating understanding the, and the economic goals and uh, starting discussion, formal discussion within these working groups established uh, within EU, uh, EU, US Trade and uh, Technology Council. This is a good, good driver uh, for, for next, um, uh, for developed uh, cooperation. Thank you, Robert. That's a very valuable point on ransomware. Uh, we've got about uh, four minutes left. As usual in these events, that means we've gotten a flood of questions, some of which we've covered, but uh, Sebastian, uh, your views on US-EU cooperation. I think what is uh, important in uh, all cooperation uh, between, on the political level, uh, it's uh, uh, also, uh, also uh, trying to involve the private sector because uh, uh, there is a, a big difference uh, from the point of view of uh, every administration and the people who are uh, really in the business. So the involvement on the private sector is, uh, is really crucial uh, for the success uh, of the cooperation. Uh, this is uh, one thing. The other thing, uh, uh, I, uh, I think what is also important to uh, create the same or similar uh, certification standards uh, or understanding on, uh, of uh, certification standards on the EU and US uh, side. Uh, from the private uh, sector perspective, uh, that creating different kind of certification standards in EU or in US uh, uh, will be, um, will be uh, uh, the difficulty uh, for providing business because sometimes you need to be certified in EU uh, for some, uh, uh, some standards, in US for uh, different standards and so on. So the uh, using the same or similar standards uh, or even uh, creating the gap analysis uh, on the national level will help business uh, to provide their services across the globe. Great, thank you. Um, we need to remember, and I, all of you have touched on the point of maturity, the internet itself was only commercialized 26 years ago. And if you were going to measure the point where we switched from it being sort of a desktop ornament to being a crucial part of our everyday lives. It might even be not even a decade ago. So this is a very new problem. Um, we've talked about three things that might help. We've talked about uh, vehicles for cooperation, both nat nationally and internationally. We've talked about incentives, particularly for the private sector and how to blend voluntary and perhaps mandatory measures and we've also, I think, highlighted the point that while everyone's doing quite well, and we're certainly better than we were a decade ago, there's still a lot of room to improve. Uh, we didn't get a chance to talk a lot about NATO. Uh, we didn't, uh, only one person brought up Russia. That was on my to-do list. I wasn't sure, um, but foreign actors as the source of threats. Uh, these are all good topics, perhaps for a later discussion, but let me thank uh, Sebastian, Robert, John, and Isabella for what's been, I think, a very useful discussion. Isabella, any final thoughts as long as you're back? And the final thought would be that uh, we should follow up on that, uh, Jim, uh, with some policy briefs uh, and then uh, some concrete actions and proposals together with Robert Koshla, John Costello, and companies represented by today, Sebastian. So I think that uh, we should put this thoughts on paper and then um, uh, make it happen. Uh, so that's, that's, that, that's from me. Thank you. It was really, really interesting. Um, uh, fruit for thought. Thank you. Great. Great job. Thanks to everyone. And everyone enjoy the rest of their day. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everyone.